Thank you so much for coming this beautiful Friday afternoon. And I cannot tell you what a beautiful person Bardell Moore is. I absolutely love this man. He is the man I am today because of him, actually, because I came in as director of studies. He was in his second year here. He basically showed me around, introduced me to everybody, and he said, if you want to be successful here, you have to be like me. <laughs> so I've been trying very hard to be like him. So I haven't done this yet, okay? But you know we have James Monroe in the works, so <laughs> and, you know, maybe someday I'll be standing here with the James Monroe book. Right, right Melissa will do the book. <laughs> um, so I'm just very pleased that he is back. Two years he served as our Sally Schellenberger fellow in environmental writing. He brought in the most outstanding people. Maybe at some point, at the end of your presentation, you could just mention Richard Tucker and uh, Winona LaDuke and Lavana Jones. Yeah, Dan Jones and the people were just incredible. Some of the top notch people in environmental writing and environmental history. So there's a whole bunch of things that you need to learn about Bart, of which uh, I've only just scratched the surface. So we really thank Camille very much for picking up on the suggestion that maybe we contact Bart and she is really responsible for his being here today. I'm just a little bit of a piece of history. But Camille, <laughs> thank you so much for making all the arrangements and getting Bart here. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to you and all get right. out of the way. Thanks, Steve. Well, thank, Steve is awesome. And it's, it's just seriously having him here and doing all this and Camille for bringing me, this is really great. Uh, this was where I started you know, my career, I guess, as a historian, I didn't actually think I'd make it. <laughs> In fact, my advisors, when I was writing this as a dissertation, when I did my defense here at UVA, they looked at me when I, when I was doing my defense and they said, we never thought you'd actually finish this. <laughs> and I said, you should have told me that, like when I started it. Because it's a big, you know, project on the history of Coca-Cola and all this. And I wrote most of it. It sounds like it's no longer Camille's office. I think it's your office down at 104 or whatever at the end of the hall there. And then whenever it was really nice, like today, I sat on the back porch and tried to write it. So you physically have a presence in this book, in a sense, because it was mostly written here at Brown. And this is where I, we did our environmental history class, and Alex was in that um, back before he was a grand poobah. So uh, it's awesome to be here. And it's kind of the last stop on a, a whirlwind tour. Uh, for this book, so I'm really excited to do this. And I want to have fun today. I want to show you some images because we I talked yesterday, and some of you were at the talk. Um, I thought it would be interesting just to see some of the stuff I was talking about. Um, I'm on camera, so I might not mention some of the uh, ridiculous things I did, like breaking into places, uh, uh, as much today. But I, I want to talk about a couple of things. I want to talk about how what this book is all about, kind of how it came to it, and then uh, let's have a fun conversation about Coke. And any question you have, I mean, I. I get a lot of weird questions like, can I drink, drink aspartame? Is it going to kill me? And all that kind of stuff. Um, and we can talk about that. Because I was originally uh, interested in, in biology and science, and, and I was a pre-med undergrad for a very long time. So I got really into the science when I was studying this. What does high fructose corn syrup do? What is all this kind of stuff? So um, today I want to talk about Citizen Coke. And this is Citizen Coke here, uh, as I like to see him. He's so smiley and happy, feeding the world. I always say, you know, feeding the world this Coca-Cola, and my friends always say he's force-feeding the world <laughs> Coca-Cola. But he's on the cover of Time magazine in 1950. This this was really the moment when Coke had become truly a global brand after World War II, and being on the cover of Time really signaled that here's this thing Coca-Cola that seems to be everywhere. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I mentioned this yesterday. I am from Coke Country. I grew up in Atlanta, I was surrounded by Coke, and um, that was one of the things that drew me to this project, was to tell a story about a company that made my hometown uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and I said yesterday that Coca-Cola is not very happy with me. <laughs> they wrote an article uh, recently, and I said yesterday that the title of it is Bart Elmore does not understand capitalism. <laughs> That's the title of it, which is awesome because I pitch myself as a historian of capitalism in the environment. So apparently, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and, but so uh, when I start off talks, I like to show you, and I'm going to show you some of the images I was talking about yesterday about my connections to Coke because I didn't, you know, get involved to to go after Coke and try and take them down. You know, this was not supposed to be a hit job. 
This was supposed to be a really unflinching look, both positively and negatively, at how the firm grew over time. And I, I reached out to Coca-Cola. I remember talking to them on the phone and said, hey, I want to know more about your secret ingredients. <laughs> no wonder they never let me into the corporate archives. <laughs> but uh, you know, I was very naive as a graduate student. But um, I had all these personal connections to Coca-Cola. And one of the things I was talking about yesterday is my connection from my high school. I went to what was called Georgia Military Academy back in the day in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and it's down in College Park. If you ever fly into the airport, it's right there by the airport. And uh, so did Robert Woodruff, this guy right here, who's all ticked off in the back, who was the boss. Many people call him kind of like the godfather of Coca-Cola because he ran the company from really the 1920s all the way up into his death in 1985. In fact, I mean, he was literally dying. And people came in to see him on his deathbed and say, you know, is new Coke a good idea? They reformulated Coke and made this new Coke formula. And he's basically saying, like, don't do it. <laughs> and that was one of the things they, they, the people that were the new presidents of the company just didn't listen to him. And it was this huge failure. So a lot of people say, you know, uh, Robert Woodruff was really this, this guy who got it, understood the Coke brand and ran it for a long time. And he went to my high school. And we wore similar uniforms. That's why I love this. I found this in the archive, and he's all pissed off. This is exactly how I was. We weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to have our hair long, which is one of the reasons I have this beaver thing going on, because we had to have it cropped and all that. So my rebellion against that is to, to grow up my bangs nowadays. But you know, he's, he's just as frustrated as me. And again, so I felt this kind of connection to some of the people. You know, he went to my school. I got it. And I felt like there were some, some good things here. And as I was talking about yesterday, here's that statue I was talking about. Robert Woodruff uh, you know, also donated a lot of money to our school. And so every day when I'm walking into my upper school, I passed underneath Robert Woodruff. And there's this little cigar with the ash falling off there that I said, you know, I really don't know what that's supposed to tell us about tobacco consumption. <laughs> you know, you're like, you're young, you're very, you know, uh, it's persuasive, you're saying, okay, maybe I should do this. But that, uh, that is the story there, that I, that I grew up with this connection. Um, but what uh, I didn't really talk about yesterday was that I came here to the university not even to write about Coke. I came here to work with Ed Ayers, who was a, the dean of the college back a few years ago. He was a great big Southern historian. And I was actually going to write about Southern public school teachers, because I was a, a Southern public school teacher in Savannah, Georgia, before coming here. And I wanted to write about the problems I saw. Like, how did it get so rough? You know, how did our schools get so uh, messed up? What's the history there? But in my second year, I found this field of environmental history when I was here. And I said, gosh, this thing is so cool. I didn't even intend to find it. And I want to do it. But you can't abandon like the dean <laughs> of the University of Virginia and say, I want to do something different. So I said, hey, you know, I want to do environmental history. I want to do a Southern topic because you're a Southernist. I want to do a Southern, his, uh, in a Southern environmental history of a big commodity. And actually, at first we said, well, cotton, right, is a big global commodity that has a big environmental footprint, or tobacco, maybe inspired by this, I don't know, okay. And then literally, I saw a Coke can on his desk. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, there's a Southern product that changed the world. That's in 200 countries worldwide. 1.8 billion servings a day. Really incredible stuff. So it was really kind of an impressive, for me, it was how do we get at this? How do we, how, and actually my advice is, what do you want to explain? And I said, I want to explain this. You know? What? This is a weird patent medicine from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, ends up all over the world, 200 countries, and this is the consumption in 1996 around the world. You can see today that uh, in Africa and Southeast Asia, this is like a gold mine for the company because they realize this is, you know, the area where they can really grow. Because you can see the United States is pretty saturated, <laughs> consuming was it 200 over 250 10 fluid ounce servings uh, a year per person. Pretty incredible. So the question became, how did this happen? And as an environmental historian, again, I wanted to look at the natural resource story. Yeah. 
Thanks, Chris. Chris always, Chris always into the photo ops. So. <laughs> so I wanted to, you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, the answer's easy. You know, they sold, they had these great marketing ploys and all this kind of stuff. And that's true, but I wanted to look beyond that and say, okay, how did they become, how did they get the natural resources, the sugar, the caffeine, all these kind of things, to put their products on retail shelves around the globe. And uh, I know this is a bit of a review, I'm gonna get into new stuff for those who were at the talk last night, but really what I did in this book was I, I ripped the back of a Coca-Cola container and made that my table of contents. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna look at water, sucrose sugar, that, was, that chapter blew up, I ended up having to write three chapters because I had artificial sweeteners and high fructose corn syrup and you know all these things. Um, I skipped caramel color. I don't know. I wanted to get done. <laughs> Phosphoric acid. I should have done that. Because actually phosphate mining and the production of phosphoric acid is, is a really intense environmental story, uh, especially in the south in Florida and Tennessee where a lot of uh, phosphate mining goes on. Um, there are about 14 natural flavors. And again, I made an executive decision. I'm going to choose one. I talked about the coca leaf a little bit yesterday uh, as one of my natural flavor chapters, and then caffeine, which was the weirdest chapter. And I want you to I'm going to ask in a second, where does caffeine come from in coca Just think about it. And then uh, we'll see what we come up with. Because I had no idea until I got in the archives, I can't believe it comes from that. Okay? So that was the idea. And what's interesting is. I never intended to find the argument that I found in the book. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you guys as, as students and as researchers to tell you kind of how this process worked. Because I never envisioned that I was going to make an argument about business. You know, I wasn't from Darden, you know, I didn't have that mindset going in. I was thinking as an environmental historian, but I really I came up with a, a bit, uh, an argument about their business model. And what I came to see with Coke. And what I call Coca-Cola capitalism is that what made Coke great is that they, they really didn't own much. They were incredibly adept at outsourcing the majority of the costs associated with producing and distributing their product. So for example, Hershey Chocolate Company, you see down on the left? That was their sugar supplier for most of the early part of the 20th century. Coke did not own sugar plantations. It didn't own coffee groves. It didn't own farms that produced the agricultural commodities that produced its product. But the, it went to other, other producers of that thing. And let's be clear, Hershey did. Hershey owned plantations in Cuba and thought vertical integration, that's the best way we can you know, manage our own stuff and get our own supply. Well, they find out in the 20s that was not a smart move because the price of sugar is fluctuating, they lose a lot of money, and they end up dumping their plantations. So Hershey becomes more like Coke over time, but Coke from the very beginning knows that not owning stuff is actually a really smart strategy, okay? Um, so let's go to that caffeine. So they, they, ought, they didn't own their own caffeine supply, and I had to answer their question. Each chapter is how did they get the stuff? So how did they get the caffeine? What's your guess <laughs> of where Coca-Cola's caffeine came from? Let's say in the early 20th century. Any guess will do? Cola nut. The cola nut. Okay. Wow, we don't have any Coke products in here. I have no prop this well, time. We do. Well, we got Coke Zero. Okay, that's good. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, we get just enough. The cola. Okay. So, first of all, you're right. Coca Cola would have included coca leaf and the cola nut. It's interesting that the cola nut is spelled with a K. They changed it to a C. Why? Because it looked good. Okay, but the cola nut was from West Africa. It does contain caffeine, and a guy we're going to talk about in a second, John Pemberton, who founded the company, he thought that caffeine was better, that it had like some taste to it. <laughs> it was actually superior to ca caffeine from other sources. Problem with West African uh, cola nuts is that it's expensive to get. Right? There wasn't a lot of people producing cola nuts, you only produced in certain areas. So it was expensive. They had to find another way. So good guess. <laughs> do we have another guess for where their caffeine came from? Anything could do. Yeah. Guesses are guesses. Yeah, maybe like coffee companies since they were getting sugar from Hershey's. 
And coffee would have been my thing, right? There's coffees everywhere, right? It wasn't coffee. Well, the suspense is building. So. It's tea. But not tea, just the regular tea that we see. It was broken and damaged what was called waste tea leaves that were left on the floor of tea exchanges around the world. And you're wondering, well, what those look like? Well, you drink it now. You know, packaged tea, that a lot of that broken tea that you drink, those, that was called damaged and brokage, broken tea leaves. And before the 1950s, before tea bags really came out that were really popular, nobody drank that stuff, because that was the trash. That was like the leftover tea. So it's an amazing story of, of Coke realizing that this is waste product that's cheap. That's why they can produce so much caffeine, because nobody's wanting it. They were sweeping up the uh, caffeine leaves, and again, they're not doing it. They find a partner to do it. Yep, it was Monsanto. Monsanto was Coke's original caffeine supplier company now we know for GMOs and all this kind of stuff. Um, and they swept up the tea, processed out the caffeine, and put it in there. Now, what's interesting is decaf coffee comes out in the 1950s. Who's going to drink decaf coffee in the early 20th century? Nobody does. Because in the whole point of, ca of coffee is to get caffeine, right? <laughs> so when decaf coffee comes out in the 1950s, Coca-Cola switches to General Foods, which has Maxwell House coffee. And they take all the caffeine that was removed from decaf coffee, which is true today. So when you're drinking decaf coffee, thinking you're supporting a caffeine-free life, you're actually feeding it into Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that happened, though, is that th this is the one that may give you some pause, is that Coca-Cola uh, discovered through Monsanto that you could synthetically make caffeine, starting at base with coal tar. <laughs> so synthetically producing it from the chemicals and molecules found in coal tar, which is true today. And now you're wondering when I drink my Coca-Cola, what am I getting? Am I getting the coffee version? Am I getting the tea or the coal? <laughs> I don't know which one you want. I don't know which one's better, the waste on the floor or what? Um, but what you will get if you call Coca-Cola, as I did, is they'll tell you that, well, your caffeine comes from coffee, tea, and appropriate sources. <laughs> that is actually their phrasing. And appropriate sources means coal tar. Which seems appropriate, I guess, OK? <laughs> so but that, you don't know which one you're getting in that, but that's the story. So you can see in each chapter, it was wild. And again, Coke is not owning any of these things. It's partnering. And here's what's interesting. Monsanto's their big, big buddy. They're buying all this caffeine. Monsanto's expanding all these plants, buying all these plants, and expanding for Coke. And then decaf comes along, and they say, "Yeah, see you later, Monsanto." And goes to General Foods, it pisses off Monsanto. All these letters go cool in the archives. Say, "Why are you leaving us? You know, we spent millions of dollars on these plants. They had to close down plants in Norfolk, uh, Virginia, and other parts of the country." Coke just moves on. And if you're thinking about this from a business standpoint, that's that's what I'm trying to get you to see. What made Coke so great is it could, it could just shift, because it didn't own the infrastructure. If high fructose corn, corn syrup comes along. Sweet, so switch to a high fructose corn syrup. You don't own sugar plantations. They're resilient, they're nimble. That's what makes them as a firm really great. And it's, that's the same uh, story on the back end. They don't own their bottlers, you know, for most of their history. It's soda fountain operators that pay for the water and the packaging. And uh, ultimately, uh, uh, in 1899, they start bottling it. That's when they began bottling it. And this is all Coca Cola sold. Uh, this is the syrup uh, drugs that they used to sell, gallon jugs that had the concentrate. So Coke had this sleep, sleep model. So I just felt that it was important instead of what I did yesterday just to talk about the fun of it. I wanted to at least give you the big theme of the book. So what was the finding? It was this, uh, this idea of what I call Coca-Cola capitalism, what made Coke great. And I'm not saying Coke is the only company that did this. In fact, I think this became a model for so many businesses, software firms other types of firms. Maybe not consciously looking at Coke, but I think in the 20th century we can see a lot of other companies that did this. Not owning producers or distributors, but making money off the flow of resources through the system, but having independent bottlers and independent suppliers you know, on either end. You're just kind of a transaction in, in, in between, a commodity broker. So that was the boring finding. And uh, I could bore you some more with business uh, models and things like that, but I don't want to do that. 
for the remainder of time before we get to Q and A, I just want to talk about one chapter and tell you a little bit about the story of how I got into it. I did coca and water yesterday, so today I want to do packaging, a chapter on packaging, which I considered an ingredient because if you don't have aluminum or plastic, you can't sell this thing in a container around the world, right? So how did they get all that stuff? That was what I wanted to do. Well, the story with packaging begins with this guy who started the company I talked about yesterday, John Pemberton. That's what he looks like. But in fact, that's not what he looks like. This is what Coca-Cola puts out as John Pemberton. Look at him. He looks great. He's got a huge beard. His hair is fantastic. He just... Why not buy a drink from a guy like that, you know? <laughs> He's super cool. He, would have, he was a pharmacist in Atlanta. Um, man, awesome. No. Okay? <laughs> this is actually who we think uh, John Pemberton is. This is brand new stuff. This was discovered at an auction uh, where a um, person found this. It says John Pemberton in the back. There's been a lot of studies on it. It also may not be John Pemberton, but we think it probably is for several reasons. One is, um, let's go back to a pretty, let me coke, coke happy right now. Okay, this is, job here. he looks good, he looks healthy. Well, John Pemberton wasn't. He was, when Coca-Cola started, he was a morphine addict. He was addicted to morphine. He uh, had been slashed and shot during the Civil War. And he was defending the city of Columbus in April of 1865. There's any history people in here. April of 1865, not a good year to be fighting because it's the end of the war. So he gets basically tore up in the last two days of the war. And, you know, it didn't matter at all. And, but he suffers from all these ailments. And so he has to take morphine. He's addicted to it. This is what's crazy about the cocaine and the coca leaf, why he's attracted to the coca leaf. He thinks it's going to be allowed him to get off morphine. He's trying to take cocaine to get off. It's like his methadone, you know. He's trying to get off of his addiction to morphine by consuming cocaine. So he's a sickly man. He's bedridden half the time. He's constantly talking about his stomach aches. People find him a little weird, okay. He's also financially suffering. His businesses have burned down not once but twice in the 1870s. He's just down on his luck. Um, so he's not that dude. <laughs> Uh, he doesn't have that certain uh, kind of gleam to him. He's actually a really down and out guy. So what do you do when you're down and out and you're trying to figure out how to make money? Well, you just copy someone else who's making a lot of money. And we mentioned this yesterday. This is Vin Mariani. This is what John Pemberton tried to copy. As I said, it was a Bordeaux wine mixed with cocaine. And it was very popular in the 1870s. Uh, our president drank it, Queen Victoria drank it, the Pope drank it, and wrote about it and said, this is great! <laughs> okay. And so, this is it in the advertisements. And Pemberton seeing this in Atlanta and says, sweet, i got to come up with an original name. And he doesn't come up with an original name. This is what he calls his drink. Pemberton's Wine of Coca. This is in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the first advertisement for what would become Coca-Cola. It's a wine mixed with cocaine. And he sold a lot of bottles. 500 a day? Probably not. Um, but at the time, you know, you could say whatever you wanted in the newspapers. It's, it's kind of the deal. But he actually sells quite well. Why not? It's cocaine wine. People are drinking it like it's awesome, because it is. Um, and then they, the problem is the temperance movement takes off. They have to remove the wine and uh, replace it with water, carbonated water. Um, because there's this fear in the South that alcohol is contributing to crime, they remove the al he removes the alcohol and places it with carbonated water in 1886. And that's really the origin stories of Coca-Cola. It's not the cocaine, <laughs> it's the wine that's problematic, <laughs> and they remove that. And this is what it was, it was a brain tonic. They, they talked about how it could alleviate things like brain worry. Which I feel like all of us have. And, um, but it would do all these great things for you, right? And here's, the, here's that coupon. It was given away for free. Because the, he understood that, and actually, I should be clear about this, it was Asa Candler who replaces John Pemberton. He becomes the first president of Coca-Cola 
who begins to give out Coca-Cola for free because he gets it. This is sugar, caffeine, cocaine, you know? Let them try it, and they're gonna want it again, you know, and drink it again. So that, in terms of business strategy, one of the smart decisions was to let people drink it, get into it, addicted to it, and start buying it. So that's what happened. And there he is, Asa Candler. He makes the, he incorporates the company in 1892. Poor John Pemberton, and he dies. He dies before he'll ever see what Coca-Cola is going to become. It's such a sad fate because you know he basically creates the world's most recognized brand in human history. And he's, he dies of his ailments and uh, never gets to see it. Asa Cameron takes it over, pharmacist in it, man. Puritanical guy. Serious as a heart attack from every single thing you read about him. Sunday school teacher, you know, very, very, very strict with his kids, very strict with his business. Um, and it's Candler who removes the cocaine. He removes the cocaine in 1903. We uh, also mentioned this yesterday. Uh, he removes it in 1903 because he's concerned about its associations with black crime in the South. It's a segregationist fear. It has nothing to do with national prohibition. He's worried that it's associated with this thing that a lot of people in the South are saying is contributing to you know, black crime. Again, a racist uh, ideology of the time, but he's sensitive to that, so he removes it. Um, I just will show you this picture. This is the, Coca the entire Coca-Cola company in 1899. And at this point, they're, they're operating in every state in the union, according to Asa Candler. And it's precisely because they have these bottlers everywhere. They have this, this unique supply structure that allows them to get sugar and things they need from anyone, anywhere. And their entire staff, operating nationally, fits on the front door of their headquarters in downtown Atlanta in 1899. It's really incredible. Um, I, I wanted to show those who I talked about yesterday. I said that they removed the cocaine uh, in 1903, but they keep the coca leaf essence in Coca-Cola. And it's this company, Maywood, a uh, chemical company, that removes the cocaine from coca leaves and, and continues to sell Coca-Cola the leftover essence of the coca leaf. It's the secret ingredient, one of the secret ingredients that remains into the 21st century. Coca leaf extract is in the flavor of Coca-Cola. It's just that the cocaine is removed by this company, which then became, this is the name of that company today, Stepan. You can read about them and see what they do. They're a chemical company that produces, uh, that sells the cocaine to, to hospitals and doctors for legal uses, and then sell secretly the leftover stuff to Coca-Cola. <laughs> and uh, it's just this weird story. So that Coca chapter was just bizarre. And I talked about going to Peru last, last time. So, so Candler is involved uh, in spreading it. He's the one who decides in 1899 to start bottling Coca-Cola. So the bottling network is really what's going to take Coca National. Um, and then this guy, as I said, Robert Woodruff, my comrade in arms, uh, he takes over the company in 1923 and he's really going to expand Coca Cola even further, believing in this model of not owning and, and, and relying on bottlers. This is from the annual, uh, Coke's annual report in 1923, and it's terrible, I know, but it shows you the dots of where all the bottlers are. Check it out 1,200 bottlers local independent businessmen who pay for the water, the packaging, you know, everything that goes into Coca-Cola. And really it's this bottling network that makes Coke so successful. So but for my story was, okay, well, how do they get the packaging? What type of packaging was Coca-Cola using at this time? And the story is that it was returnable containers, returnable glass bottles that would go back and forth between bottlers and consumers on average over 30 times back in the early 20th century, including the 1920s. It was a returnable system. And it worked for the bottlers because they, they didn't have to buy more ma packaging materials each year, right? They just had these, they could just buy these returnable bottles. 
But over time, Coca-Cola wanted to find a new lightweight package that they could ship their product in. And you think they switched to uh, cans pretty quickly, but it's not until the 1950s that they start canning soft drinks. And it's really amazing how that story plays out. It's actually the brewing companies that start canning beer in the United States. And it's because of prohibition. Prohibition eliminates all these different breweries. And so big companies like Schlitz and Budweiser and Paps see all these markets that are open because all the local breweries have been closed down. And during, uh, right after the uh, prohibition, they start shipping steel containers that they don't have to go pick up and return. There's one-way containers, as they're called, to all these different markets. And that's where the aluminum container emerges. It can't emerge in the soft drink industry because they explode the cans. Soft drinks are actually twice the pressure of beer. So if you shake, and you've seen some crazy, I'm sure, some YouTube videos of like how explosive Coke can be. What happened was they tried to can it. They said, ooh, the brewing industry is doing this. Can seem great. You don't have to go collect them. You can just send them out there. But they explode. The other thing that they did was the acidity of Coca-Cola is so <coughs> intense, about 2.4. It's the pH. It's extremely acidic that it ate through the can. Okay? So they were like, okay, well, it eats through the can, it explodes the can. So what they had to do was design a stronger can. And today you'll see this too. There's a resin on the inside of containers uh, for, for Coca-Cola and soft drinks that prevent the acid from eating into the aluminum. So put that in your stomach as you think about it. <laughs> in fact, the acidity of Coca-Cola is so acidic that the tankers that, that take this around the country, with they were to spill, uh, they, they have to have hazmat stickers, environmental hazmat stickers, because it's so toxic and so acidic that if it spilled, it would create like an environmental disaster. <laughs> so, so these were real issues. Uh, but ultimately, Coke is able to solve them. And by the 1950s, they start packaging things in what we'll call one-way throwaway containers. Now, for as an environmental historian, all, you know, all this works for a little bit. It's great. It's cheaper in a way because you've know, you got this lighter weight material. You don't have to go reclaim it. You don't have to wash the bottles. So this is a better system for Coke. They think this is great. And they can consolidate their bottling The problem is it ends up everywhere. It ends up everywhere and people start getting fucked off. They start saying, industry is wasting you know, well, resources and making our, our parks ugly and everything else. They should be forced to pay for this. So we see, uh, if anyone's from Michigan or Oregon or Vermont, we start seeing the passage of mandatory deposits. That is, these five to 10 cent taxes that are placed on containers so that if you return this, to uh, a bottle or, or retail, you would get five to 10 cents back. Industry hates this because they think that's gonna raise the price of their products. So they start trying to fight back. And they start trying to fight back through organizations like Keep America Beautiful. An organization that when you look at that, you say, ah, that sounds so nice. Must have been founded by the Sierra Club or something. You know, or people that love polar bears. <laughs> but it's founded by the soft drink, brewing, and canning industries to deflect accusations that they're to blame for all this. And the argument is, we're not the ones causing the pollution. It's those consumers who keep throwing their stuff into the you know, streams and in the national parks and everything else. And their slogan is awesome. It's something straight out of the NRA. It says, people start pollution. People can stop it. Okay. <laughs> So this is founded in the 1950s and the 1960s and 70s. They're doing all these advertisements. And this was the most popular one. It came out in 1971. It was ra it's rated one of the top advertisements in American history. And it's called popularly the crying Indian commercial. And I think uh, I can pull it up. And I want to show you if I can uh, that commercial because I think it's worth seeing. Okay? So let's see this. Some people have a deep, abiding respect 
for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. Oh, <laughs> no can't. start pollution. What is that? People can stop it. <laughs> now, does anyone know the great irony of this? When I say that, if you did know, you would, you would jump immediately in. He's not even Native American. Yeah, yeah. Okay? There's several things that's kind of problematic about this, but one of the things is, you know, he's not even a Native American. He's actually an Italian American. Iron Eyes. So first of all, we're playing up this ecological myth that the Native Americans somehow are in, d deeply in tune with nature in a way that others aren't. You know, it's deeply problematic if we talk about that historically. But it's also that he's not even Native American in the first place. <laughs> So, you know, I think it's just a, a kind of all around just a really fantastic um, kind of situation. Um, uh, but but this, is, this was a huge deal, and it's coming out because states around the country are saying, we're going to tax these packaging. And in fact, there was a national, a proposed national ban on throwaway containers. That is, containers that are not returnable. Proposed by Congress in 1970 and 72, supported by over 22 House of Representatives. We almost don't have these, right? Well, there was a lot of support against it. So I don't know how almost we were, but the industry was worried about it. And that's the context for them saying, you start the pollution, and you should stop it, right? And so that was the argument that was coming from industry. They also went around the country, and I found this in the, the national Soft Drink Association's basement. I snuck into their basement. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but they would give out these handy guides to litter to teach kids that your hand, you're the, you're the problem, little kid, you know? Uh, and that hands alone cause litter. And great thing about the end of these is these little kids are also thinking, and soft drinks are great, you know? <laughs> Drink them and have all this stuff. So it's like two things, but this is what's happening in the industry. And Coke at this time gets on board with this. This guy, J. Paul Austin, he's the president of Coca-Cola during all this. I'm going to be clear. I like him. I actually think he was a really good person. <laughs> Got to read his papers. I think that's important to hear. All these guys aren't villains, evil folks. He really believed in the environment. He wrote all these great speeches about how we got to fix the environment and all this. And he really wanted to try and change things in Coca-Cola. So he, uh, he came up with this campaign called the Bend a Little campaign, which was sexualized. It actually, I don't know if you can see, but it featured a kind of attractive woman bending over with a short skirt to pick up litter. And the idea about all this was that if we just bend a little, you know, you know we, we can find these attractive women and we can, you know, uh, clean up the environment. It's kind of a two in one. We can follow them around while they take care Sure, sure. <laughs> So this, this, is, this is the idea, and it's actually different than what Coke ever did before. They never used to have very sexual imagery, but this is 70s. They're kind of being a little bit more provocative. But the idea was, let's just hand out litter bags. It was funny, because it's actually plastic litter bags. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they had posters and all this litter that was being produced to promote all this. But he really thought, you know, maybe we can make a difference. Maybe we can get consumers to do it. Um, but he went beyond that. And this is where it gets interesting. This chapter, I was trying to figure out, you know, what was the best package? What's the best environmental package you can have? And that's exactly what Paul Austin wanted to know. Is it plastic? Because it's lighter weight, right? And uh, you don't have to wash it, so there's not water pollution. Is it aluminum? Because it's lightweight, but it recycles better. You know, which package is the best package? This is what's amazing. Coke commissions the first life cycle analysis study ever in 1969 to study which package has the best footprint uh, out of all footprints. Life cycle analysis, it's what all sorts of industries do today to assess the environmental footprint of their cars and everything else. It really starts with this study with Coca-Cola. And Paul Austin is the one who commissions it. Well, I called up Coca-Cola because I'm a pesky graduate student. I think I was even in the room over here. And I said, I'm a Sally Brown fellow at Brown College. And they were like, oh, great, gr graduate student. It's going to be annoying. And I said, hey, can you send me this study that you did? And they sent me a nice letter that said, 
your request is not in the interest, uh, best interest of our brand, <laughs> end quote. And I said, well, that makes me very interested, right? So I want to figure this out. So I'm still pesky. I'm sitting over there, and I said, okay, well, I, can, I know the scientists. They mentioned the scientists that did this report. I'm going to call them up. So I called up the scientists. And they're, they're, I'm just kind of sad that the guy's kind of dying, really. He's old. He was like, yes, I'm here. And I was like, yes, you're here. Okay, help me out. <laughs> and he on. said, look, I said, can I get this taste? And you know, it's proprietary. I can't give it to you. I can't, I can't do that because it's, we did it for Coca-Cola. And I said, oh, okay, sorry, you know. Nice. Have a nice life. Uh, and then I, he goes, well, wait, wait, wait. We did the exact same study for the EPA. And the rest of that study was done in 1969 for Coke. They did the exact same study for the EPA in 1974. And they did it for mainly beer containers. And he said that the exact same evidence and the same findings are in that report. And guess what? We did it for the EPA. It's public. Go to, your, go to Alderman Library. So I went down to Alderman, and I found this. Okay. And it was amazing. Because a lot of you are interested in like, well, what, what was the best package? Well, maybe washing the bottles is worse. They tested for everything. You know, how much, how many raw materials are used in this? How much energy is used in producing this? How much water is used? You know, how much atmospheric emissions? On every standard, they looked at different containers. And this says 19 RET, which means returnable. A returnable glass bottle that makes 19 trips. This is a 10-trip returnable bottle, just one that makes 10 trips. And by the way, at that time, they knew that 10 was super easy. Maybe they weren't going to get to 20 or 25 return trips, but they knew they could do 10 returnable uh, trips back and forth. These were um, aluminum and steel composites, a kind of type of plastic, um, and just aluminum cans. So you see different varieties. They look at all of these things. Um, and this is what they find. No, this is the report. Key conclusion that no throwaway container will be improved to match or surpass that of a 10 trip returnable glass bottle in the near future. They knew it. They said, This is the way to go. It's going to require some restructuring of your bottling industry, but this is what you should do. I was so struck by it that I called him back up. He was still there, fortunately. Uh, and I said, Am I right on this? Are you telling me that this is what you said? He said, Hands down. We told these folks that a returnable container is the best thing that we can do. And the reason why I double checked on them was because Paul, S Paul Austin said this in 1972. He's citing this very research in public. He said, through our research, we're convinced that the plastic bottle is one of the most environmentally responsible packaging options available to us in the future. Now, I said I like this guy. How can I like a liar, right? Well, it's because I don't think he was even lying uh, in his own mind. I don't think he was lying. Uh, when he was speaking in how he perceived what he was getting from his scientists. And this is why, uh, what I'll argue. He was struck that the plastic bottle, when you looked at energy, right, because plastic comes from petroleum, he thought it was going to be, this is the energy crisis of the 1970s, roughly. Right? We're going to see the prices of oil going up. He thought there was going to be a lot of oil. And he found that, actually, there was a lot less energy in terms of oil that's, that's going to go into this when you think about the production and the heat that's needed to do all these other things like glass and, and other types of materials. So he was struck by that. And he was convinced that plastic recycling was going to take off. He was convinced that we we're going to have new technologies that was going to enable us to reclaim this. I don't know what you're this, but, but, but to be able to reclaim this plastic bottle and it, that it would be okay, that we'd have recycling systems that would work. And in fact, they pushed for that. That's what's so surprising. We think of recycling as something that environmentalists fought for. And what I found in the chapter was really that the software and brewing industries were the ones that really wanted this. Because they realized that this, and again, this was a great way of having other people do your work for you. Pay for the infrastructure, reclaiming this material. Don't put taxes on our stuff. Just tax them another way, it's slightly less obvious. And it looks good, and it's, it's good for the environment, but keep us from having to pay these you know, mandatory deposits and these kind of things, okay? So they pushed for curbside recycling. I think he thought that it was going to work. He thought that, that we'd be reclaiming it. But here's what I found, okay? And this is the last slide, so I know I've gone on a little bit, but I, I wanted to share this stuff with you because it was so striking 
This is a graph of PET plastic bottle sales and recovery, that is recycling rates, since curbside recycling in the United States really took off. And what you can see is that the rate for recycling has only increased marginally for really oh, almost you know, two decades. And today, I, I, taught, I mentioned this yesterday, this statistic you can know is that only 30% of PET plastic bottles are recycled today. 70% end up in landfills. Uh, and that's what this is showing. That We thought we were going to be reclaiming and reducing the amount of packaging waste, but you can see the number of sold and number wasted and going into landfills <coughs> is still increasing. Um, so I'll, I'll just want to conclude with a thought as the environmental writer here at Sally Brown. What did I learn from this? I think if we learn from history that bad people do bad things, then we've essentially learned nothing, right? I think this was a great story of somebody who I think really believed as a businessman that he was doing the right thing, that there would be a new technology that would fix the problem in the future. But he put such hope in that technology that I think he ignored his own advice from people that he really had commissioned and even paid for that told him, hey, you know, we're not convinced that recycling is going to take off, as you saw, in the recent, you know, in the, in the years ahead. It's going to take a long time for that. So you should try and switch to the returnable container. Um, so I think it's a case of kind of having this belief in technology to fix a problem that overrid, over kind of rode what he was able to see from his own scientists. And I think that's something for all of us to think about as we go out to do business and other things to be kind of, he didn't intend for this to be the consequence, right? But it was the historical result, I think, of, of what ended up happening. Um, so I'll leave it at that, and uh, maybe we can do some questions and, and have a little conversation about all this. And I'm happy to talk about anything, whether it be packaging or anything else. Well, Lincoln Park is chair back. You give him a round of applause. Right? Thank you. I will just say this. Yes, Bart was in the office, 106, where Professor Thomas Hunt is now. And we witnessed him going through all this research, and he'd come over here to the law office, and he'd sit and he'd talk, and he'd say, well, guess what, I'm just trying to figure out, I'm trying to do this. So I lived for one year with him doing this research, so it's very nice to see that all the effort you put into that has resulted in the book, and the dissertation, and the PhD, and all your successes. So Thanks. Thank we you. should open this up to questions, because I'm sure you have many. Yes? Yeah. Uh, going back to the graph depicting like co-consumption around the world, why do you believe Coke is targeting um, like African countries as their next market? Because you know a lot of companies that are going global tend to go to West Europe or uh, China or India first before Africa. So. Yeah. So uh, a two-part answer for that is one is the reality in the United States, just something to know, is that soft drink consumption in the United States has declined by 20% since 2001. Wow. It's a remarkable reduction. And it's largely because of concerns about obesity in our market here in the United States, but also in the markets you're talking about, in Western Europe, there's the same concerns about the relationship between obesity and consumption of Coke. That is not as prevalent in these, what, what do we want to call them, emerging markets or developing uh, nations of, of you know, certain, um, you know, Nigeria would be a great example where they're really targeting uh, the expansion of bottling plants and things there, and also in India, but it's just simply not the same kind of fear about obesity rates as there are here. You know, the, the United States today, we have 35% of the nation is considered obese. And that's given a lot of, raised a lot of concern when you're talking about a product that said yesterday, right, that the syrup concentrate original formula, which is fairly similar to today, called for five pounds of sugar per gallon of syrup. So you can imagine a gallon jug with five pounds of sugar in it, right? People are, are not consuming it in the same way in these markets, and they, they've got that. So what you'll see in the ten, uh, what's called the 10K reports, or annual reports for these firms, is the share, they'll say to the shareholders, we're selling so much Coke Zero and Diet Coke in the United States. You know, we're, we're all about saving people. Yeah. And then you'll go down to India and Africa and these other areas and say, double-digit growth <laughs> in Coca-Cola Classic, you know, and Sprite. And it, it, I think, to, to answer it clearly, it, it's largely because there's not the same health fears in those markets. And they know that they, you, it's the same thing that happened with cigarettes in Marlboro. 
you know, when we started realizing that cancer causes, you know, is, is largely linked to tobacco consumption. What did Marlboro and these companies do? They went to markets where people were less concerned about that. And I think that's what we're seeing today. Yeah, it's a great question. I had a question about one of your slides. Um, before the false picture of the owner, uh, or the company. Yeah, um, try and go back. It was a picture of a building that might have been a bottling company, and I just wanted to ask if you knew where that was. Yeah, that one. Uh, I don't know if I know where that one was. It might be. Uh, Is it Rona? It could. It could be. Let's see. <laughs> it, did really look, it did look. It did look a lot like Rona. Really. Yeah. I think I lived in that building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I planned that. Yeah. I knew it was going to be here. And, you know. Um, it's after. It's after this yeah. one. Uh, no, oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Back. yeah. Yeah, you go back. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, try again. <laughs> <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> yeah. That's kind of creepy. There. Actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's Julie's restaurant. And it's called Hygia Bottling Works. You I know if that was on the thing? Yeah, I think it is Rono. Uh, in behind your. It was a Frank Hardy photo, and I could probably husband. find it. This one, Jacob's Pharmacy. Yeah. This one's in Atlanta. That's in Atlanta. That's yeah. Atlanta. And I mean, that Southern. Both of them towns. look like. Yeah, I don't know. They both look similar. <laughs> yeah, it looks kind of like it could be where um, now Billy's restaurant, the Coca Cola. Print is still there on the brick building. Wow! And it's a bottle. It was a bottle. Well, what I'll, what I'll say about this though is that um, you know I was trying to figure out how to tell the story, and how do you tell a story about a corporation that doesn't like you, you know, because they don't want to give you information. And one of the things I did was say, well, there's all these bottlers. Maybe they maybe somebody donated some papers. And what was amazing is the big one of the biggest bottlers in the country is was stationed in Richmond. And she was uh, Betty Sam's Christian. It was, it was a woman that ran this bottling company. It was a huge empire. She was a great uh, female business leader. And she just donated. She was like, I did so well. I want to let people know about this. So she gave all of her boxes to the Virginia Historical Society in Richmond, which was sweet, right? Because I get to drive down to Richmond. And it was unbelievable. You know, their financial ledgers, how much they were paying for water, which was nothing. You know, and I was able to, I was able to say, you know, 80% of what they're selling to us is the public. Well, how much did it cost them to get all that water? And you could see in the ledgers. It wasn't even on, it wasn't even on an expense. It was like coupled with a bunch of other things because it was so cheap, you know, which, which made for some interesting stories. But, um, yeah, and you also just saw these, these back and forth between co corporate and the bottlers, you know. So I got to see a lot of the, it's amazing what they don't sanitize, you know. I think they just want to be remembered, but they forget that they were like bad mouthing somebody, and there was these little letters that they give over to these archives. So, so that was kind of fun. Yeah. Speaking of the water, did you talk last night about your trip to India to get into a bottling plant? Did you already bring up that trip? I yeah. snuck in to see how much water Steve, they were. Steve, the camera's on. Oh, I'm just kidding. No, it's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did. I mean, I talked you about it. You can edit this. No, no, no. It's fine. <laughs> okay. No, I, I, I've gone to India, and I know this is a little bit of rehab for something, but I'd gone to India, and I had tried to meet with Coke. They had said they were going to meet with me. They didn't meet with me, and I was really pissed off because I'd flown from Charlottesville to India, and uh, they weren't going to meet with me, so I just said, I'm going to walk into this bombing plant. <laughs> and I was in Rajasthan, so I just started walking in with the workers who showed up and they were bust in and I got in line. With were you trying to blend in with I think I was. I mean, I was, small I was not, yeah, I really just wasn't uh, with it. And uh, yeah, I got kicked out and um, chased and uh, my taxi driver sped off and it was really great. Um, so yeah, there was definitely that too. I wasn't always in archives or in the Virginia Historical Society. I remember coming, I think I did that afterwards. I was like, this is so nice. <laughs> I'm not being like assaulted and uh, I can just, Read papers, you know. So, yeah. Sorry. Um. So I've been to Germany, yeah. and like the Coke and Sprite and Fanta over there mm -hmm. taste very different than the Coke, like those drinks here. Yeah. And I was wondering if, in your research, you found anything regarding a, a change in the syrup, although that doesn't sound right. Yeah. Um. Like when I was over there, it tasted fresher. Like it. It wasn't like. Um like artificial, yeah. and so I was just wondering if there was anything about that. Yeah, so there's two things I'll say about this. One is, a lot of you probably are wondering about the Mexican Coke versus Coke thing. I'll talk about that real quick. Uh, which is, you know, there's a Mexican Coke that has real sugar in it, mm -hmm. and all my students uh, at Alabama say, well, I know. 
you know, some of the house, thick southern accents. I grew up in Georgia, so I can do that. Um, you know, I know that I know this high fructose corn syrup is worse, and I know I, I can taste it, you know. So I do it. I come in with a blind study. I have 40 students in the class, and I have a little taste test, and we do it. See if anyone can figure out whether it's Mexican code or the regular code. And what I do is glass bottles with high fructose corn syrup and glass bottles with Mexican code. It's, they cannot figure it out, and they're all pissed off at the end of it. You know, they're like, I knew, I thought I knew it. They can't tell the difference. But some of it's perception, in other words. Some of it's the containers. Mm -hmm. So I think Mexican Coke, you know, you gotta understand glass is a lot more inert mm -hmm. than uh, aluminum lining can, which actually does leach, we know, some flavor and contents in it, so it has a less crisp taste. High fructose corn syrup and sugar, you could say that there might be a perception difference, although they're very similar molecularly. Um, the, the processing obviously is very different, and in Europe, and in that case, if you're in Europe, you gotta understand Coke does. There's, they outsource everything. When they ship overseas, the concentrate doesn't even contain sugar. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even contain the most expensive and important ingredient in the thing. They they figured out when they started franchising overseas, why put the sugar in it? That's expensive. We have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So it's all sourced locally. The local bottler has to get it. So if you're in the Netherlands or something like that, it's, it's beet sugar that's in your drink as opposed to high fructose corn syrup in the United States or sugar if you're in Brazil because of whatever's the easiest sugar to get. So that could play a role in it. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other thing is, yeah, these, these formulas change a little bit. And for different localities, they're slightly different. Even though they want uniformity, it's, it's hard to impose that sometimes, especially when you're changing the sugar content. Yeah, so. they don't use aluminum cans over there. They use primarily um, plastic. So I just want, I wondered also if that played a role. The, yeah, and the containers do. The other thing I'd say is that the water is locally sourced. Yeah. And even though there's an incredibly high processing uh, a lot of these bottling plants reverse osmosis and these kind of things. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of difference there. Yeah, and I, I remember in the book you talked about how, um, like, before um, there was the nationwide, um, like, water treatment plants, mm -hmm. how all the, like, water in, like, Florida and such right. would be um, more uh, sulfuric and, like, the water tasted different. So I guess that would also play a role over there. Yeah, and the yeah. biggest problem I think you, you may have seen in there was chlorine. When they start chlorinating water, Coke goes crazy. Because what does chlorine do? It basically bleaches your drink. And they're like, ah, we want our, you know, one to look like Coke. And so it's looking different. And they said, well, we've got to figure out a way to deal with this chlorination. And that started imposing on their bottlers that they filter out, use carbon filtration to start getting this chlorine out of their water. Because it was changing the color of the drink. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, going along with that question, I guess another question about Coke's business model. You said when uh, Pemberton first started the company, he kind of replicated what that wine company was doing. Yeah. Uh, and like today, we think of Coke, Coke as a very unique brand, and like you said, it's the most recognizable brand in human history. I was wondering, when do you think like the transformation occurred? When they became their own company, or their own brand, or do you think that that's a lot of the marketing and the business model and the strategy is still um, what it originally was from that wine company? Yeah, I'd say two things. One is. The biggest shift was, was Pemberton taking out the wine. Why? Because wine's expensive. You know, the, the original Vin Mariani and the Pemberton's wine cost a dollar. A dollar back then, you know, a dollar was a lot. Uh, but the Coca-Cola with water cost five cents. I think that was one of the big changes. Making a, a mass marketable, super cheap product that people could afford, everyone could afford. Um, the second thing was getting rid of all that brain tonic, brain worry stuff. They st you don't see that anymore in Coke advertising. You wouldn't see like fixes your hangover. You know, it doesn't <laughs> say that because they realized this is what's so amazing about their advertising, their brand. They realized in the early 19 teens, who wants to be associated with sick people with headaches? <laughs> that the smart thing to do was to brand yourself as being associated with these happy middle class, good looking people, and and to to actually make no claims about its medicinal properties. Just say it generates happiness. <laughs> Which is, you know, then they came out with all these things. The pause that refreshes. What is that? It sounds nice. Okay, you know, always Coca Cola. Okay, yeah, you know, very kind of ephemeral, but really staying and trying to associate with baseball and, and Sam Claus, all these kind of things. But not associating it with as a, as a kind of medicine, because they realized that was actually a small market. 
of consumers. And you, you see that in their advertising material, that that was really a big shift for them. Right now. Alex, then on this stage. One thing was, uh, we were discussing the transition from uh, from glass bottles to aluminum and then plastic bottles. Uh, a lot of the bottlers were fans originally of the, the glass bottle and Coca-Cola basically to bully them into switching. Did they just say, we're going to go to a different bottler if you don't agree to this? Like, how did they manage to get them to be such a major infrastructure? It's a really complicated story in which what really ended up happening was some bottlers were getting big enough, had enough capital to be able to be a kind of centralized bottler that can distribute these one-way containers over larger distances and go away from the returnable system. There were smaller bottlers in towns, maybe this one in, in Virginia, that uh, could not compete with a bigger bottler that could, to, could operate on that kind of scale and wanted to keep the returnable system precisely so that you only could have this returnable kind of regional boundary. And so yeah, there was these kind of two groups of bottlers, I'd say. It wasn't just that Coke was bullying certain people, but that certain bottlers were a wanted to expand into other people's markets, where some of the bottlers realized that they didn't simply have the power to do that and wanted to stick with the returnable system, and they write about it. When Coke's pushing for recycling and all this stuff, they're saying, you're subsidizing the big bottlers. And we, as the little bottler, want to be able to, to compete. But if you pay for this recycling system, which is essentially a public you know, welfare for this, these firms, then we're going to be priced out of this market. This is exactly what happened. And you saw returnables continue for quite a, quite a while, um, where people were fighting and trying to hang on. But then you just see these centralized bottlers being able to break into those markets with the economies of scale. So, um. Is Palm Wonderful owned by Coca-Cola? Oh, man. I don't know. Because <laughs> um, I... There's so many brands. Yeah, I yeah. think they are. Um, but I remember I was, I used to, they used to make this this tea that they would sell in these glass jars, um, which was, like, really cool. Um, and you could save the glass jar as a cup, and mm -hmm. it was awesome. And then at some point, I vividly remember this, because it was a big deal to me, mm -hmm. um, they switched to plastic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think they sell the tea anymore. I don't. I, I think they completely got rid of that product. Um, but I remember when they switched to plastic, they put like a little note card on it that was like basically saying that switching to plastic was a better idea environmentally. Yeah. And it, I remember reading it and just being like, "What? That makes <laughs> like, sense, yeah. What do you mean?" And so it's really interesting to see that there because I. I do think Palm is, is owned by Coca-Cola. That was, re you know, that was within the last decade um, that they said that. Yeah. Um, of course, at the time, you know, they weren't, they didn't have any sort of system set up to return those glass bottles. So, like, I guess so. Yeah. Of course, production of a one-way glass bottle is more environmentally impactful than the production of like a single-trip plastic bottle, but. Yeah. Not if we're actually using the, the product to its full extent. And I think, you know, for me, I should just say, as a historian and as somebody who was, you know, here as a fellow, um, and I think a lot of the fellows that came before me here have this similar mindset about what we wanted to do as scholars, which was we wanted to engage. Obviously, as teachers, we wanted to be in the classroom, and that's why I think the fellowship supports that. But as a scholar, too, I wanted to weigh in on questions that I think were present day that people were weighing in on. Like, what is better? Like, well, they're telling me it's the plastic container, and that's what I really wanted to find. And to, and to show, like, it's not just history for the sake of history, but to me, showing, okay, people are gonna have this debate, well, what's the better system? And I wanna show them that, historically, we have some actual data that can help us make these decisions today. And that, it, you know, because I was constantly running into people that I was meeting in Newcomb or whatever, maybe it was some of our lunches, who were like, well, man, like, you still gotta clean the water, you know, the bottles, so it's probably a lot of waste. And I kept being like, okay, well maybe they're right. So let's go figure that out. And let's see if we can find the answer and, and, and tell that story. So so to you, to your point, it's like I was intrigued by exactly what you are. Well, is plastic better? You know, and I think this report, again, the scientists were still alive, and I think it's all out, it's it's dated a little bit. But it was clearly an, an intense study once they said, they said, no, the returnable system's better. It would have been hard for a lot of these centralized bottlers to retool themselves. 
there was a business yeah. decision there too. It would have been really hard to do it, but hey, Copenhagen has done it. You know, and I mean, Denmark, you know, we were talking about this, the, you know, roughly 98% of containers are returnable because they, they put a very, very heavy price on one-way containers. And guess what, Coke didn't, Coke didn't vanish. You know, they found a way to adapt to those pressures. So, um, I think we could get, we could imagine returnable systems once again. You think about Newcomb Dining Hall. You know, I used to have a little mug at, uh, when I was an undergrad. I was in East Wheelock, which was brown for, for Dartmouth, which is where I went to school. And, uh, you know, they gave us a mug. And we just reuse that every time. We don't do that a lot on campus here sometimes, you know. It's getting better, I think, in some ways. But I think the returnable system, we can imagine so many different ways of doing it than the way we do it now. Just throwing away oil. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, when did Coke start uh, selling, like, Dizani and bottled water like that? Was that in response to the drop in soft drink consumption, or was that before? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 1995 or 6, late, mid to late 90s. And it's actually Pepsi that does it first. They actually, they're, they're having debates. I, I see them in the documents. Like, Come on, the public's not gonna drink repackaged public water, <laughs> you know? And they're like, <laughs> no, 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 no. I think they will, you know? And then well, let's see if Pepsi did. Pepsi, Pepsi came out with Aquafina first. It was actually Pepsi first. And he said, well, let's kind of watch this. See what's going on. And Nestle's doing it too. They're kind of watching all these things. You know, they kind of get Poland Springs. They get it that people would buy spring water because that's kind of special and unique. And then they see Aquafina, which is tap water. And they're like, wow, people are buying tap water. <laughs> so yeah, they come out with Dasani. And what's amazing about Dasani, first of all, Dasani, the name, um, <laughs> it means nothing. They I did all these studies, and it just, they like, that's the sound. They all, that's the sound that works. It's not a place, not a thing. It's just a made up word. Second thing I'd say is that, uh, we talked about this at lunch, Alex, and uh, Boy, did Sonny, Coca Cola doesn't own things. Remember, we talked about that. Now, they started buying up their bottlers in the 80s, but they, they still had a lot of independent bottlers. You know, they don't own the infrastructure. Okay, so then, well, why doesn't the bottlers just bottle their own bottled water and sell it? Coke realized that. Oh my gosh, we've got to have some connection. What's going to be our syrup? So, what Coca Cola does, the way they make money off the Sonny Coke corporate, is they sell a mineral packet. It's a packet of minerals, and that's the syrup. What's funny about these minerals, the same darn minerals that are in the ground that come out that the bottlers remove take through the processing of it, they take out those minerals, and then they buy these minerals to put, to put back in. And of course, it's a special combination. That's Coke's argument. That's the flavor of Dasani. But is it you know, 10,000 times the, the better? Because that's the price difference. And I show you in the book the difference between what you pay for tap water, if you got a gallon of tap water out of your tap, and what you're paying for design, it's literally thousands and thousands of times more expensive. And so when they did it, you're absolutely right. It was like, boom, no. I mean, this is talking about profit margin. This is how they made a killing. Because again, where's the water coming from? It's a completely public resources that's dirt cheap, but you can charge $4 for a gallon of it. Brilliant. And saved them, I think, during a time when soft drink sales in the United States weren't particularly, you know, Increasing so much. Um, how does Coke hope to expand in Africa when water is already so limited? Yeah, part of it's using the government. Okay, and I, uh, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request with the United States government and State Department. I filed a bunch when I was here. I filed it with CIA. <laughs> they wrote, "What are you doing? We're the CIA. We're not giving you anything." You know, I think it was better phrase. Basically, that was the interpretation. And I uh, did it with like the FBI. I did it with all sorts of different agencies just to see if there was any relationship between Coke and the government. And yeah, these FOIAs, Freedom of Information Act requests, we as citizens can file these letters to say, give me all your documents, government, on your relationship with anything uh, in a business. I got a ton from USAID, which is a, uh, an aid uh, agency that provides foreign aid and assistance to countries overseas. And from an organization called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which I didn't even know existed. But it's an agency that helps fund businesses and uh, does foreign assistance. And what I found from these Freedom of Information Act requests is that Coca-Cola receives millions of dollars in guarantees and insurance to build bottling plants in Nigeria, uh, 
uh, I'm thinking Nigeria a lot because this is the hotbed for where they got most of their assistance, to build bottling plants. And the argument was they should get this assistance because they can provide water in a place that doesn't have water. So they're being subsidized in a way to produce a bottling plant as a means of hydrating a nation that doesn't have a lot of water because there's not a lot of public water infrastructure. Now, taking off my scholar hat for a second, I would say, isn't there a better way to do this? I mean, isn't it, we really want to build bottling plants as public aid, you know, because ultimately people are going to have to buy the bottled water as a solution to their hydration needs. It strikes me that foreign assistance aid should be built to build public uh, infrastructure that can be used by, um, by the citizens. I should be clear about this too, the good and the bad of Coke. They have done a lot of good things in Africa to try and, and create um, water filtration systems for, for, for local communities and trying to do things, but the scale is still quite small. And when we think about our federal dollars being spent, I, I'm not so sure I want it to be spent on building a bottling plant for a business that makes $9 billion, you know, uh, in profits in 2012, at least that's, that's what I remember. Um, I'd rather be to develop larger scale infrastructure, you know, that it helps people get water in places that really don't have a lot of water, clean water, for cheap. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one more question, and then I have the raffle tickets. Do you want to get the I last wonder, question? Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> when did the polar bear get incorporated into their advertising? Does that have any alignment with the environmental movement and save the polar bear? Is there anything? Yeah. Yeah. Like that? So it, fairly recent, you know, it came out when I was writing it for the most part. It was in the 2000s, um, you know, after 2006 <coughs> for sure. And what's amazing about that is that <laughs> oh, it's so incredible because it's all about climate change, right? It's like we got to save the polar bears, and we can do this with rebranding our cans. <laughs> they rebranded the cans, and if you recall, I don't know if you saw these polar bear cans. They were very white. You know, they were kind of, they weren't the, the, the red Coca-Cola Classic. And what they discovered was that consumers were getting confused about, is this Diet Coke? Because in the Diet Coke lighter, right? Or is this regular Coke? So they had to discontinue that release of those cans. Now, from a climate change perspective, that had a huge cost in terms of having to realign your, your industry and and reshape your industry and get and go back to it. So there's all these cans that end up being wasted because they were branded in a certain way. You had to reprocess them and then reship them out with a new packaging. So what's fun, I mean, funny or sad about all this, right, is that this was a campaign to reduce their energy inputs, right, or to suggest that we're trying to. And then ultimately the, the canning thing flopped and they ended up probably using more energy, which means more you know, you burning fossil fuels and more climate change. So it's kind of a wild story where it backfired. But again, with a good intention, like I think the people in Coke aren't saying, we want to screw the polar bears, you know? <laughs> I think they really want to help the polar bears, but a lot of the times it's just not fully thinking it through or um, things that happen that they've put in place that have these huge consequences because they're so big. And if they do make a shift like that, right, it's the, the impact they have is incredible. So, yeah, poor polar bears. <laughs> yeah. So, we have three copies of the book. Who needs a raffle ticket? If you didn't get it, who, who's up for a raffle ticket? Okay, Eileen, do you have a book? you have a book? You have a raffle ticket? you have a book? you have a raffle ticket? Who else? Raffle ticket? <laughs> <laughs>